Hi, and um, welcome back to my YouTube channel. And uh, today I'm going to uh, do a bit of a book review. Uh, I'll show it to you. It's this one here, an Australian bird book, and it's by Mr. John Leach on the back there. And this is uh, quite an old book. It's got an introduction by Charles Barrett, but this was the eighth revised edition. So a little bit about um, John Leach. This is a bird book with a difference. There are heaps of bird books around these days, and uh, they usually go along the lines of bird identification books. Well, at, um, at that stage in my recording, the phone went, and then I sort of stopped and hung up and and uh, hung up on or stopped doing this video. And then uh, I thought, I'll c I can come back to that later. But then I thought, why don't I just continue with some audio? I've given you a video introduction, and I'll just do the audio of what I was going to talk about. And I might show you a couple of illustrations afterwards. So, so I'm talking about this bird book by John Leach. It's called An Australian Bird Book. And um, I'm going to put a link underneath the video uh, to a an article that I wrote on my blog many years ago about um, all the great bird writers and bird photographers and bird artists uh, that are abound in Australia that, that we owe our heritage to, our wildlife heritage to. Um, but there are many unsung heroes, and one of them was well known back in the day, but probably forgotten a bit by a lot of people now. And his name was, as I said, um, John Leach. And there's a forward in this book by Charles Barrett. I've also mentioned before, and in the link below, you'll hear a bit about Charles Barrett as well. But um, I'm just going to read this book. is not like the, the normal bird books and things you get these days are either a photographic, in you know, book book that's showing some beautiful photographs and and how they were taken and where they were taken and tips on how to do that, or they can be just a bird identification book with lots of photographs and lots of descriptions of the birds. This book is a bit different this Australian bird book. When was this published? Let me just have a look here and see if I can find out. Um, when was it? I should have looked that up before in advance, shouldn't I? This was 1939, this one was. So there you go. It's going back a bit. And um, I'll just read a little bit from the, the forward in here. And But what I was saying was that this... Um, book is more or less a, a narrative about birds. He just goes from the different bird groups and talks about them as if he was talking to you and me, just sharing his knowledge in one long narrative, I guess. Uh, and it's a fascinating uh, book, and it really dives into the fact that uh, he was very involved in, in setting up um, uh, training for school children originally, and very much involved in identifying birds and helping with the naming of them because in, there's been a lot of changes in names in birds in Australia and around the world over the years. Just read a little bit about um, uh, this introduction called The Doctor. And I think this is by um, Charles Barrett, who my late father-in-law corresponded with many years ago when um, when he was just a, a son, a um yeah, when he was just a lad of about 11, I think, and wrote to Charles Barrett about birds, who was a prominent uh, nature and bird study uh, journalist. This is called The Doctor from the introduction by Charles Barrett. Country schools were the nurseries of men who have achieved distinction in many fields. Science, art, letters, war, politics and commerce. Country lads had fewer opportunities than those of the city, but were compensated by a better way of living. The lessons they learned in the school of the open were of more value than those conned indoors. The author of this book was a country boy. He was born at Ballarat in, on the 19th of March 1870, and he became a country school teacher. His duties after promotion had brought him to Melbourne, involved long journeys through the bush, undertaken gladly. He never lost touch with nature. John Albert Leach was educated at, educated at the Creswick Grammar School and was ducks of the school and matriculated when 14 years of age. Though a nature lover in boyhood, he began as so many of us have done with bird nesting. It's a disappearing habit of the human boy and girl, I guess, for that matter. Uh, and you're not allowed to do it these days. For his one and only collection of bird's eggs, he made a dainty glass-covered case. This was a present to his future wife. On completing the training of teachers' courses in Melbourne, the um, 
Keen young student from Kresik received an appointment as assistant in metropolitan schools for one year. Then he was sent to Goyora School in the Mallee. Beng Warden was his next school and there he spent five happy years living in the picturesque schoolhouse with its beautiful garden and enjoying cricket, tennis, riding and social life. He attended the Bairnsdale School of Mines and studied science. Science studies occupied the young teacher's rare leisure hours. For one year, however, he had leave of absence from his departmental duties without salary in order that he might do practical work at the university to complete qualifications for the Bachelor of Science degree. Dr Leach's first inspectorate, inspectorate of East Gippsland entitled Much Driving Through the Bush and Gave Opportunities for Nature Study. As at his wish, Mrs Leach accompanied him frequently on long trips. They went into the byways and off-beaten tracks. Old campfires gleamed in memory, and even when the doctor was assistant chief inspector of schools, perchance he sometimes thought how pleasant it would be to win back for living over again one of the far-off days when the billy was boiled and the chops were grilled by a nature lover and his wife in Gippsland Wilds. That's just a little bit of introduction, and Charles Barrett was a very eloquent writer, and he goes on for quite some some time in uh, uh, talking about... Uh, in giving us a good introduction. I'm going to read a little bit more from the book in a minute, but there's another book I have here, and I'll probably put a picture of this up somewhere, uh, called The Flight of the Emu, A Hundred Years of Australian Ornithology, 1901 to 2001, by Libby Robham. Now, back in the day, The the Emu was a publication that came, came out for many years, and it was a wonderful source of in, information about bird life. There's a, and there's a a list of all the people that contributed to that first hundred years of bird watching and bird identification in Australia and bird, bird education. And this is what it says about John Albert Leach. <coughs> Leach was a teacher and headmaster in several Victorian primary schools and later organising inspector of nature study, 1907 to 1920, and senior inspector of schools from 1920 to 24. He was a member of the University of Melbourne Extension Board for 25 years. He gave weekly radio talks on natural history from the mid-1920s. President of the RAOU, I think that's the Royal Australian Ornithological Union, from 1922 to 24. He was editor of the EMU from 1914 to 24 and 1928 to 29. He was the convener of the RAOU Checklist Committee during the production of the 1926 edition of the official checklist of the Birds of Australia. Instrumental in founding the Gould League of Bird Lovers 1909 and introduced the League and Bird Day to Victorian schools. He wrote monthly nature articles for the Education Gazette 1905-19, to an Australian Bird Book 1911, which is what we're looking at today, and Australian Nature Studies, 1922. In 1930, members of his nature study classes formed the Leach Memorial Club. So there's a little bit about from that book, and that's a beautiful book, and um, perhaps I should talk to you a bit more about that in, in depth later on sometime. And um, I'm just going to find some things that um, he, uh, he spoke about in here in this book, give you an idea of the type of writing he did. Uh, I had a spot picked out before, now what have I done with it? Just bear with me, I'll just pause for a second. Found, I think, where I was up to. I'm just going to um, read a few um, paragraphs. Um, he just goes from one type of bird species to another throughout the book and, and gives you um, his thoughts on some of them. Um, <clears throat> he's talking here, he was talking about birds of prey and um, going on from hawks through to owls and he's talking about kestrels here. Kestrels are fond of mice and would, if allowed, spend time protecting the farmer's haystacks. But if a kestrel comes near the farmhouse, the gun is at once produced and the farmer loses the services of one of his best friends. Jeffries and other nature lovers have written on the marvellous powers of hovering possessed by these birds. In fact, the kestrel is frequently called the wind hover. In Australia, kestrels frequently nest in a hollow tree, but do not lay the usual white egg associated with nests in such a position. The osprey, we now go on to the osprey. The osprey is another example of bad naming. The word is said to be a corruption of ossifrage, the bone breaker. 
as it Ossifrage is spelled O double S I F R A G E. I bet you didn't know that. Uh, corruption of Ossifrage, the bone breaker. As it feeds on fish, it has no big bones to break. It is spread from Alaska to Brazil, Lapland to Natal, Japan to Tasmania, and even out to the Pacific Isles. And it may be the same bird throughout, though Dr. Sharp has allowed three species in the hand list of birds the AOU checklist of North American birds, 1910 recognises the North American bird as a subspecies only, subspecies only. And the Australian bird is also listed as a subspecies by the Royal Australasian Ornithologist Union in its list of Australian birds. These birds eat living fish which they catch by plunging into the sea. Occasionally they drive their talons into too big a fish and not being able to withdraw them are drowned, possibly to form a more efficient fish trap for holding slippery prey. The osprey can reverse the outer toe and so may have three toes or two toes in front. There you go. Flinders, Matthew Flinders, who was a famous explorer of, of Australia and South Australia, in his journal wrote about the enormous nests seen on rocky points and considered they were built by a great Dinornis. That's D-I-N-O-R-N-I-S. The osprey and the white-bellied -bellied, white sea eagle build on rocky points if no trees are available and add to the nest each year. It is interesting to read in the Western Australian Yearbook article on birds that the government has placed an osprey's nest in the cave district under the protection, under the protection of the cave warden. In 1920 we visited this nest rock, the smallest reserve by Act of Parliament in the world. Then he goes on about owls. Hope you can stay with me. I'm just doing this a little bit longer version of, of a, like a podcast really. Just as the diurnal birds of prey are closely related to those of the northern hemisphere, so are the nocturnal birds of prey, owls, and they're very closely related to those of the old world. The different kinds of owls are so closely similar that there are many disputes as to their classification, and it is not likely that we shall ever be able to recognise in the living, free state all the species recognised by scientists. This is a little bit interesting because it's about my hometown. I was interested at the Adelaide Museum to see our leading ornithologists fail to pick out the skins of two English barn owls when they were when they were placed with three Australian lesser mast owls. I think we still we call them barn owls now. And yet ornithologists ornithologists give our birds such widely different names that literature is useless to us. These names have hampered the popularization of bird study in Australia. If ornithologists with skins in hand cannot separate them, what is the use of manufacturing species? Australian and British birds are now considered the same species. He's talking about these owls. As owls are active late in the afternoon or at night, there's always been a certain amount of mystery regarding them. And speaking generally, the ordinary observer knows little of them. Two of the Australian birds have forced themselves on our notice to some extent. The powerful owl, the largest of our owls, has alarmed many with its blood-curdling screeches heard in the quiet forest gullies. The boo-book owl, though not often seen, calls mopoke, which sounds like boo-book to the Aboriginal ear, but became cuckoo. The best loved bird call of their far distant hand to the sorry, the best loved bird call of their far distant home to the ears of the homesick first white residents in Australia. And it was and was it not they asked what one might expect in a country where Christmas came at the wrong time of the year, where the trees were always green and shed their bark instead of leaves, where the leaves grew vertically instead of horizontally and gave little shade. Was it not natural that the cuckoo, a day bird in England, should become a night bird in this land of paradoxes and contradictions? Thus Australia's reputation was added to even added to even by the boo book owl con confusion was caused for when daylight came and the frogmouth was seen sitting in the tree, it was supposed to be responsible for the frequent calls of the previous night. Some reliable observers claim that the frogmouth does call mopoke occasionally, but the boo book owl is responsible for the frequent mopoke heard even near Melbourne on calm evenings in springtime. Next time you hear the bird calling, say, mopoke to the call, then say, more pork, cuckoo, buck, buck, and boo book. The bird says just what you say. <laughs> and he goes on to say how the owls are divided into two families. We have the mopokes, the boo book owl. I've actually photographed one just around the corner from here one day in a tree. 
and uh, causing some excitement because it was in daylight. But we'll occasionally hear them here, but especially when we're out and about, if there's big gum trees nearby, you'll hear them at night calling. And I love the sound of, of what we call the boo-boo cow or the mopoke. So there you go. That's a little bit of an introduction to um, John Leach and uh, his Australian bird book. He was a real pioneer, as there were many others. And um, I'm going to put a link to some of the, the things that I was talking about on my blog some years back now to further add to what I've said here today. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And um, I thought if I do it this way with an audio, you'll get a little a bit more detail. And if I have to have the discipline of trying to record myself and make sure it all comes out right, etc. So thanks for watching. Like if you like. Subscribe if you wish. And uh, I'll see you next time there. I'll probably try and put a photograph of this uh, uh, Flight of the Emu book and tell you a little bit more about that in the notes underneath as well. So thanks. See you later.